of Scripture that this is an emphasis that the Holy Spirit has given to us. There, there's more recorded pages wise and words given to us. The final week in Jesus' life and all the other weeks combined. So it's like the Holy Spirit is wanting us to slow down, look at the detail of what Jesus was willing to go through, uh, the passion of Christ, which would take him to the cross. Now, for those of you who have been worshiping the love of God in the last several weeks, you know that we're in this Jesus, Son of God series, and we broke it down with the first year, the inaugural year, Jesus' baptism, so his professional life. So the first year, calling his disciples, getting to know him, and realizing that there's something very special about him, his divinity. Uh, second year, year of popularity, uh, where word got out, Jesus is a, a miracle worker, uh, is he the Messiah, and it just uh, the popularity spread where Hundreds of thousands uh, became followers of Christ. Third year, though, year of rejection, where those hundreds of thousands <coughs> turned their back on him and walked away. Uh, we are in that year of rejection, uh, and this is Palm Sunday, and, we, and the gospel reading is the, the reading for Jesus entering Jerusalem. There's a glimpse of Jesus' glory, and we're going to be a part of that. Um, for the text this morning, we're, we're going to be preaching, I'll be preaching on Revelation chapter 7. So often we look at the original Palm Sunday and that we forget that uh, there's pictures of heaven of us holding palm branches before the Lamb of God. So you will be part of it, so will I, uh, by the grace of God. Uh, there's not a sermon online for you this morning, uh, but the second reading is the text for, uh, for the message. And, and today we're going to look at entrance like none other uh, this Palm Sunday. If you have a cell phone and you would mind, please turn down the volume. If you have a smartphone and a Facebook app, if you check in places, please check in the Lamb of God. We appreciate that. Also, there are connection cards available for you. Every row of chairs has these, uh, so the row of chairs in front of you. If we would, now would be a great time as a family, if you came as a family or as an individual, uh, please pull out a connection card, and later in the service, then uh, simply put the fill out connection card as we gather the offering. Let's put it in the offering today. Let's begin our, our Palm Sunday worship with prayer. Dear Lord God Almighty, we call upon your day. We have set aside this time in keeping with your word to worship you. Uh, bless our worship as we look at the events of the original Palm Sunday, as we look at the prophecy of the Old Testament. Jesus, help us to not just go through the motions and in our mind give you praise, but also in our actions, in our meditation. Uh, bless your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we begin with the the opening hymn is in your hymn 130, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna.
Dear brothers and sisters, <coughs> excuse me, in Christ Jesus. The good news is God loves you dearly. He knows that we are sinners. That's why He sent Jesus our Savior. Please know that through Jesus, through His perfect life, through His innocent suffering and death on our part, through Jesus rising from the dead on the third day, please know that your sins are paid for in full. That God loves you, and you are right with Him in Christ Jesus. Uh, let's uh, respond with uh, the song that's there. It's called Blessed Be Your Name.
We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the bull of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the end of the earth. Just think about that for a moment. The kingdom of God, we pray, the kingdom of God, the Lord's prayer, your kingdom come. And that's happening. The Bible says the kingdom right now is within us. God gives us that peace that surpasses us understanding. And from one end of the earth to the other, um, Jesus is reigning right now through faith. One day, we're going to see it by Saturday. Our second reading is the sermon text. It's Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Those in white robes, who are they? Where do they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let's stand for the third reading, which is the Gospel lesson. So our Gospel lesson, uh, the works and words of Jesus, have been recorded for us this morning in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. Uh, verses 1 through 11. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as a king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with your colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, uh, to you, say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. <coughs> This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from 
the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. We take time now to profess our Christian faith. We're going to use the words of the Nicene Creed. This is an ancient creed. It, it dates back to about 400 AD. Everything in this creed is, is based uh, solely on, on the Word of God. It's a beautiful summary of the Christian faith. Let's speak these words together. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Christian, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. And we sing now uh, the song, A Jesus So God.
children up at this uh, time for the introduction to uh, Kids Church. Uh, just come forward and have a seat. Good morning to you. Yeah, have a good morning. Yeah. Um, right before, right before the service, I. I Took a big bite out of an apple because I like mine to eat apples. And um, inside the apple was a seed. Here it is. See it? It's a little seed, right? And you, you've seen these seeds before? Not this one, but other seeds. seed. Um, well, what happens if we bury the seed in the ground, put some dirt over it, and add, add some water? It grows into an apple tree, doesn't it? And you get more seeds. And you can eat more apples. And it's pretty, it's pretty neat. This little seed, little small seed, can turn into a very large tree, and other apples can grow from that. It's pretty cool the way God, God designed this little seed. But this little seed has to do something for that to happen. You have to water it, sunlight, shade, heat, it has to have the right amount of heat. But the seed itself, you know what happens to it? It actually dies. It, it breaks apart. Uh, it breaks apart, and then what grows from the seed is the tree. Uh, we might say, we were saying it, we said, uh, we said that Jesus, you are the sacrifice. We have a big word, sacrifice. Uh, but it means to, to, to die. And, and you're just, you've all heard about that today, why, why Jesus had to die. But kind of like the seed, uh, Jesus died so that we might live. And you're going to learn all about that today in, in, in Kids Church, the sacrifice of Jesus and why he did on his life. And uh, it's a really, it's a cool thing because um, we can have life forever because Jesus was willing to die for us. All right? So you can go now through those double doors to Kids Church. Before the text is Revelation chapter 7, the, 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 through verse 14. I want you to listen though, because I'm going to get into chapter 8, just a few verses that will help us better understand the context of um, our message today. So, this is Revelation chapter 8, uh, verses 1 uh, through 5. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people and the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, I mentioned before that in this Jesus Son of God series, we're really right at the end. Three and a half year ministry, the third year, year of rejection. An upside was that Jesus was able to spend more time with his disciples that they needed that, that preparation. Um, 
we look at the year of rejection, you can imagine having hundreds of thousands of followers, and, and they all walk away from you. They truly reject you. If you've ever been rejected, I've said this before, you have a friend in Jesus, he knows what rejection is all about. But then, almost miraculously, the Sunday before his death, we have this beautiful event called Mount <coughs> Jesus, outside of Jerusalem, Beth Page, close to the Mount of Olives. And there's, there's, a, there's a road, there's a path. And it, it winds down. Uh, there are there's these really sharp uh, turns because it goes down and then it goes back up the other side, down the Kindred Bell and back up. And then you go through a gate and you're into uh, Jerusalem. And on that very special day, a very spontaneous thing happened. With large crowds. And they're in Jerusalem for the Passover. More likely, the crowds that were there were there for the entire week. I don't know why you would go to Jerusalem the first day of the week and not stay for, for the entire Passover. They're there. Jesus and his disciples are there. And Jesus tells his disciples, you know, go ahead of you, and there's a guy and a donkey and a colt, and I'll bring it here. And then a very beautiful thing happens. Jesus gets on the colt of the donkey. Disciples put their, their coats on top of that, he sits on that. And then spontaneously, people are taking off their cloaks. They're cutting down, more likely, palm branches. And they're, they're putting them in front of Jesus as they slowly and peacefully rides on that the pole of the donkey down that path and then up the other side. And as he's riding the donkey, uh, th th there are crowds of people and they're joining in Psalms of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. And we know that of those who were there, children were also singing these praises. And, and we have a glimpse of the honor and the glory of Jesus. That scene is a preview of coming attractions. And I believe, based on God's word, that we're going to experience something very similar to that when Judgment Day is over. Now, if you look at the original Palm Sunday, there were three groups of people represented. And I want you to picture yourself in the crowd. And again, only one of three groups. Uh, the first group would be the followers of Jesus. Uh, this, of course, would include the 11. I'm not going to include uh, Thomas, not Thomas, uh, Judas anymore. Judas, uh, in his mind, has, has already uh, planned to, you know, to despise Jesus, reject him. But the 11 were faithful followers. There were other faithful followers, though. We know that in Jerusalem alone, there were about 120 faithful followers of Jesus. Perhaps some of them were there that day. Um, and, and, and these are people that, again, that devoted to Jesus. They didn't quite understand the, the, the crucifixion thing yet. But they're following Jesus. Um, there then were the fair weather followers. And I think most of us here know fair weather, what, what that means. Perhaps some of the, the, the children don't. But uh, if I'm a fair weather diamondback fan, which I am, it means that if they're winning, I'll probably go to some games, right? I'm a fan. If they're not winning, I'm not there. So there were fair weather followers of Jesus that day. Um, and I think most of those that were there fall in this category. Fair weather because that day they're offering palm branches to Jesus. They're honoring him. They're there for the whole week. We know that by the end of the week that Jesus' enemies were able to stir up the crowds, probably the same people, and they would uh, be changing what they said about Jesus. From blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to crucify him. <laughs> crucify him. Then the third group represented were the enemies of Jesus. Um, not that, that Jesus considered them the enemy, but they considered Jesus the enemy. And the irony is these were the religious leaders, the clergy. They were there. They were already plotting how to murder Jesus. It, it always gets me. These, these, these are the clergy. These are the guys who wore robes like I'm wearing, who were the, the teachers in the church. And they're there, and again, they, they want Jesus dead. Now, 
if you were there the original Palm Sunday, which crowd would you be part of? Would you be the fair weather follower of Jesus? Would you be a devoted follower of Jesus? Or would you be among those that want Jesus heard? Now, when I've asked myself that question, and I did this week quite a bit, um, where would I have stood the original Palm Sunday? I want to say, I really want to say that I would be one of the faithful followers of Jesus. Right? And I want to say, I would have given Jesus 110%. I might be more supportive of Jesus than even his disciples were. I want to say that. However, I really wonder if that would have been true. I'm standing up here in a row. I'm part of clergy. Right? And, and there is peer pressure in, in every profession. There is peer pressure among the clergy to conform. Part of me says, you know, maybe I would have came under that pressure to conform to the leaders at the temple and would have considered Jesus the enemy. Or maybe I would have been a fair weather follower. Great <coughs> that day, pops in front of Jesus, and within one week, crucify him. What about you? Where would, it, where would you have stood that day? You're probably thinking, well, maybe a fair weather follower, I can see that. Hopefully a faithful disciple, but I wouldn't be one of those Pharisees. Don't be so sure. Uh, the Pharisees share something in common with, with us, all of us, and that's a sinful nature. Theologians have pointed out for a long time that there is a Pharisee in each and every one of us. Theologians call it the opinio legis. The Pharisees were of the opinion that, that uh, they were better than others. They were doing things the right way. And if anyone was getting to heaven, it was them because of the right things they were doing. And lurking inside of us is that same nature of thinking, I'm better than I actually am. Now, as you contemplate that, where would you have stood? I want to flash forward to our text in Revelation. Because it's very similar. There is a large multitude carrying palm branches. Now, as we get into our text, Revelation, you have to understand, Revelation is, is a very difficult text to understand and to interpret. I, I've studied it my entire life several times, multiple times. Every year I go through it several times. The first three chapters of Revelation are, are easy, really. Uh, Jesus appears to John, who's now an old man, and, and it tells John to write seven letters to seven churches. It's pretty straightforward. But then, chapters 4, 5, and 6 get really intense. Bizarre, bizarre stuff. And he's, he's seeing a vision, several visions. Chapter 8 gets very intense. We have the opening verses. For there are seven angels who are given seven trumpets, and each one blasts the trumpet, and then a very severe judgment of God takes place on the earth. Really intense. And what lies in between is chapter 7. And chapter 7 is a, is a breath of fresh air as you study Revelation. And, and, and our verses are, are before us. And with, with that in mind, I want you to listen again. Verses 9 and following. Happiness I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, Those in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. 
and he who sits in the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So the elder asks, John, who are these? So it's a fair question for us. Who are these people? Now there are clues given to us. Um, these aren't people just from one particular nationality. This particular group, they are from all over the world. Uh, every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. It's very similar to the very end of Revelation. We have a very, very similar picture. Notice what, what Jesus, the Lamb, and it's, it's interesting. He's the Lamb, but he's the shepherd. The Lamb is our shepherd. And, and what does he do? He wipes away every tear. Again, very similar to the, 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 the closing chapters of, of the book of Revelation. Now, in understanding who this great multitude is, from every tribe, nation, and people, too large to count the number, go back to what Jesus said after he rose from the dead, before he ascended to heaven. He gathered the eleven, and he told them, Now you go make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I taught you. And Jesus said, start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, Samaria, ever increasing portions of the world. The crowd in Revelation 7, who are they? They are the fruits of the labor of these disciples. They are the church. They are us. Now, we look at this multitude and the, uh, the angel, the elder, tells them that, that they came out of the great tribulation. Now, the Christians differ on this, the great tribulation. And some of our Christian friends who might be more of a reform background would say, no, that happens later. And then they read Revelation like it's chronological completely, that, it, that this follows this and follows this. The problem is, in Revelation, there are seven visions, and it's apocalyptic language. And there are clearer portions of Scripture that, that are, it's easier to go the clearer portions of Scripture to determine the less clear ones. And they say the Great Tribulation has not happened, that's in the future. But I would remind you of what Jesus said last week. Remember last week when, when Jesus gave an answer like another about the end times? Uh, did he describe the end times as everything goes great? Just the opposite. Jesus said that, that there are wars, rumors of war, increase in wickedness, love of the world's cold, that there are famines and earthquakes in various places, many fall away, increase in wickedness, some are going to die, be persecuted, and then the end will come, right? I would call all of that tribulation. Uh, also, Jesus said to his disciples, in this world, you will face trouble, tribulation. So take heart and overcome the world. In the book of Acts, uh, I, I believe it's Paul, says this, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And, and Paul said 2,000 years ago, we're in the end times. So if Paul said it was true 2,000 years ago, how much truer is it today? The Great Tribulation, it's, it's Christians giving up their lives. Their lives coming to an end. And, and quite often, there is, it's much tribulation. We've been praying for, for a long time, Pastor James Oldfield. He, he died last week of brain cancer. Tribulation, right? Hardship. Quite often, that's the way it is for, for us in general, in, in this life, that, that, that we die of weakness. We die perhaps in old age, or perhaps it's an accidental death, whatever it might be, but it's tribulation. And what happens when a believer dies, Paul said that when you die, your body remains, but you are now present with the Lord. And Paul said, better by far. To be absent from the body, to be dead, but to be present with the Lord. That's the scene here. 
These are people who are being added to the presence of the Lord, the church. Um, if we go back to verse 14 of our text, it says this, I answer, sir, you know, he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, it says that they have come out of, it's a present tense. These are they who are coming out of the great tribulation and are now entering the presence of God. I've entitled this message, Entrance, like the other. And up until this point, all these titles have been directly tied into Jesus. Question like another, was Jesus questioned? Answer like another, Jesus answered about the end times. And you're probably thinking, Entrance like another, it's Jesus entering Jerusalem on Sunday. Or Jesus on the last day, and the glory to his name. And if you're thinking that, you're partially correct. Entrance like that other, it's first of all, based on our text, it is our entrance into heaven. You know, many of you have had loved ones who have died recently. And if you think of it again, what they went through before their final days, Paul says in the reverse, so in weakness, the Bible is buried again as his one of weakness. And we know that when Christ returns, we'll be raised with a very strong, resurrected body similar to his. But a person who dies, a believer, that day becomes their, their best day of their life, their life so far. But everybody thought to be in the presence of Jesus. And then what John saw in this vision are, are, are people who are entering the, the throne of heaven, being added to that number that nobody can count, who are now directly in the presence of their Lord. It really is an entrance like none other. And what, what a great day that would be. Now, after this vision, it's very comforting, we get into chapter 8 again. There's silence for half an hour. Can you imagine being in heaven and there's silence for half an hour? It's building up, right? And then what happens is seven angels, seven trumpets, the first trumpet blasts, and, and, and judgment is happening upon the earth. Now, God is very patient. He's patient with you. He's patient with the world. God wants everyone to come to a knowledge of truth and be saved. Extremely patient. But there is a time where God's patience runs out. That's it. When it comes to this world, it's judgment day. That's it. Now, how is it? How is it that when you die as a believer, you'll be able to enter the presence of God, seize the Lamb, have a pot branch in your hand? How is that possible? And the answer is because Jesus, the Son of God, has already faced the full judgment for your sins. Keep that in mind. Things will get very intense right before the end. Judgment day, very intense, extreme judgment upon the world. But you have to understand that Jesus has already undergone all of that judgment on your behalf, my behalf. <coughs> As we enter Holy Week, it's going to get very intense. As we see Jesus go to the cross, the full wrath of God was placed on Jesus. Because my sins need to be paid for. And they were in heaven. So the reason we can one day go to heaven and we have Paul branches in our hand, it's because salvation comes from our God. Salvation is because of Jesus Christ. His blood washes me clean. And that is the gospel. The good news of Jesus. Now, if you follow the rest of the Revelation, again, it gets very intense and, and you see the, the final judgment. And then Jesus will gather all believers in front of him. And, and then we, we, we see, again, eternity beginning. Be, uh, begin. And it, too, will be a great and glorious day. Thank you, praise God, today, again, that, that the Holy Spirit has brought you to understand what Jesus has done for you. And that you believe him, you're good. Um, where would we have been original? Palm Sunday? You know, it, it doesn't matter.
because Jesus has paid for all of our sins. Going forward, by the grace of God, we can be part of this second Palm Sunday of the Lord. <coughs> by the grace of God, our branches in the presence of Jesus the Lamb, who was slain, who was risen from the dead, great and glorious. What a great day that will be. Now may the true peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Him. The assignment out to gather our offering as the offering plate is coming by. If you would, please put the, the connection card into the offering plate. Thank you. safe birth and delivery of Kate, excuse me, Taylor, daughter of Luke and Mandy, uh, who are also friends of Wendy Strader. Uh, Taylor's premature, as you know. Uh, we ask you to your will to help this little girl to grow, uh, become healthy, and please uh, bless more uh, the care that she receives now. Holy Father, we continue to lift up loved ones and friends. Uh, they include Doug McRae, a friend of Danielle Pointer. Cheryl Pye, friend of Marty Anderson. Betty Smith, mother of Kim Hazel. The Norton family, friends of Marty Anderson. Our friend from our congregation, Pastor Bob Bouchard. Uh, Jerry Weed. Anthony Esposito. Help these individuals with, uh, again, the health problems we're facing. Bring health and healing to be your will. If not, give them the strength they need to bear these uh, crosses at this time. 
continue to give direction to Kristen Palermo, and also to Anthony Palermo and Samantha Castilla, as well as Geneva and Gerald and Ashley. Heavenly Father, as we pray through our membership, as I thank you on behalf of the of God, we pray for your gifts to us of the Wadsworth families. Please put a special blessing upon them in this new week of your choosing. Help us, Lord, as a congregation to reach out to the Wadsworths, to encourage them uh, with uh, genuine encouragement from the Christian faith. Hear us now, Father, as we lift up to you private prayers and petitions. Heavenly Father, I also pray for the family, the survivors of the 38 who were, who were killed this morning in, in the Christian church in Egypt, killed by, by ISIS. Uh, please, again, help those families. What a horrible thing on Palm Sunday. But uh, Jesus, as they're in your presence now, please, uh, please bless them. Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it to give it to his disciples, saying, Take me, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. And our, our communicants may approach the altar of the record of
brothers and sisters in Christ, as you think about uh, different aspects of Palm Sunday, as you look forward to Holy Week, and I pray, invite you to come to our Holy Week services here on Monday, Thursday, uh, through Friday, and then Tuesday, Sunday, sunrise at 7, and special service at 9.30. Um, I, I, again, I want you to think of the quiet before the storm. That's today, Palm Sunday, the intensity that Jesus went through. And also, again, as we face life and things are going to happen unexpectedly, the storm happens. But there is resolution. Uh, Jesus promises that we will be in his presence. Uh, and for all eternity, wipe away every tear, uh, comforting us. So all the promises that we have in Christ Jesus are beyond uh, what we could possibly imagine. And they're just uh, so great. But think of what lies ahead. And thank you, praise Jesus the Lamb. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you uh, with his comfort and give you peace. Uh, let's close with the closing hymn, back to closing song, and it's called forever.
that's kind of the, the goal on Thursday here. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And uh, Jesus uh, gave the command. Uh, a couple of things. When we look at what does it mean Monday, Thursday, what did Jesus command us? And that will be our focus. Uh, Good Friday, uh, Tenebrae uh, is, is one of our uh, popular services here. We graduated uh, the first year at Girls Darker, deep in silence and in darkness. Uh, Saturday is a big preparation day, getting the breakfast ready, setting up chairs and tables. Um, and if you can help with the Saturday setup, uh, 10 o'clock would be the, the, the time uh, to do that. And we always rely on volunteers as a congregation for that. Um, and of course, Easter, uh, two services, sunrise at 7, and then 9.30 festival service. Um, and we have like two different crowds. It will be really the same message, just slightly modified for the festival. Uh, but uh, we invite you to come back. I do need help from the older children here, like confirmed or high school age, uh, or you're about to be confirmed for my congregation class. Uh, we are doing the resurrection trail at 845 next Sunday. I need help with that. So immediately after we dismiss here, if uh, older children, again, junior high, high school, if you can talk to me, if you're able to help, uh, I'll gladly take your help with the, with the resurrection prayer. Um, Smith, did you want to say anything about photographs? Oh, yes, we got one. Okay, go ahead. Um, if we have a picture of photographs, maybe like maybe in our um, Binghamton Church directory, uh, you can email or text me a, a recent photo. school or <laughs> since he's graduating this year it's a little it's a little old but yeah so if you can send us an updated picture we'll get that on the yeah and we have some uh, uh new members who they, they don't have the photograph at all uh, but, uh we need to get that done uh so talk to stephanie if you can email even take a picture here if you don't care it's a selfie um or just a, a, a new picture um talk to stephanie she updates the online directory if you don't have an online directory uh, we need to get that done too. Uh, a link for that is an app on your phone. It's really handy to see names and faces in that. Or if you're a friend of the congregation too, we'd love to have you as part of the, the online directory. Uh, so yeah, please talk to Stephanie about that. Any other announcements? Stephanie? Okay. Speaking of the um, getting ready for Sunday Easter, can um, we still need some people to volunteer to sign up for the prep work, on, especially on Sundays, either um, the service? getting ready for breakfast or the actual cleanup afterwards. And um, she will be here really at 5.5 on Sunday morning to start that, getting the breakfast ready. And like I said, the sign-up sheet is in the back. And for those that signed up for, to bring them food or other items for the buffet, please um, have them here by Saturday 7 a.m. She'd prefer if you have them here by Friday night service so she can start um, getting it together and seeing if there's other things we still need to take out. <coughs> Thank you.